Hello, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this special presentation for International Women's Day. My name is Janik Goryeb, and I am the Senior Health Education and Engagement Specialist of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And I'm so pleased to be here with you this evening. Um, at the end of the webinar, or when you have to sign off, or when you do sign off, a survey is going to pop up. So please just take three, two, three minutes to complete that for us. It really helps us to plan for other virtual events and other webinars down the road. And looks like that the closed captioning is working. So if you do need that, um, you can click closed captioning at the bottom of your menu if you don't see it, but it should be working automatically now for you. And so happy anniversary to Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. We've been around for 40 years. And um, let's see, see some love in the chat there uh, for, for our 40th anniversary. Every day here at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, we strive to bring hope to all those affected by a brain tumor, hope through support, hope through information, through education, and through research as well. And our hope really is to find a cure for all 120 different types of brain tumors. No matter when you joined us uh, through this 40 year uh, history and journey, we would not be here without you. So please join us on social media, share your stories, share your pictures uh, using the hashtag bringing hope 40 years. And we're gonna just kind of keep that conversation going throughout the year uh, in 2022. You are the power to our movement to end brain tumors. So thank you for, for being here with us and let's support one another with messages of hope online. A uh, big thank you to Novacure, who is a sponsor of our 2022 webinar series. So shout out to Novacure. And a shout out to these four incredible women who are joining us tonight in a few minutes for International Women's Day. We have Dr. Zadeh, we have Danielle, Shreya, and Vaseli. Um, we're super excited to have them here with us. This year's theme for um, IWD, International Women's Day, is Breaking the Bias. And it's all about celebrating women's achievements, raising awareness against up against bias and taking action for equality. And we're looking at for you know, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that's diverse, equitable and inclusive. And so we're really, really excited to have these four incredible women with us this evening. But before we get into that, just a few logistics. So make sure you give some love in the chat for all of our presenters. Um, so a few things, the webinar is automatically recorded. So if you wanna watch it again later, you can. For those of you who've missed it tonight, you'll have access to it later. There's two, um, you'll see two sections in your Zoom menu. There's a chat section, a Q&A section. The chat is where we're gonna use when you wanna just like give kudos to the presenters or kind of use your emojis to, to get the conversation going. The Q&A is where I'll, I'll ask you to please um, submit specific questions that you're gonna have for any of the presenters. And we'll either take those up throughout the presentation or at the end, depending on the theme of your question. And for everybody who stays until the end, you will be eligible to win a door prize. And this month's door prize is a really cool knapsack from Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. So make sure you stay till the end to, uh, to potentially uh, win, this, win this door prize. Okay, so we're gonna do a couple of poll questions. Stop sharing my screen for a moment. And the first poll question is, have you ever attended a webinar with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada? Just to give us an idea what the mix is. I'll give you a moment to answer that on the screen. You should see the poll question pop up on your screen. Give everyone another couple seconds. Okay, well, look at that. So almost 60% of you are, are new to uh, Brain Tumor Foundation Canada webinar. So thank you for, for joining us. And for those of you coming back, welcome back. And the second question I have for you is who is online with us today? So are you a patient, survivor, or thriver, primary caregiver, family member, friend, a healthcare professional, maybe a researcher, or possibly a student? or other, if it doesn't come up on the list. Give everybody a second to answer that. We have a nice mix of people here. So great, thanks everybody. So yeah, it looks like about 40% are patient survivors, thrivers, 3% caregivers. We have some failure members and friends, 28% some healthcare professionals and other. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for um, 
for participating. I appreciate that. And uh, we're ready to, to introduce our presenters. So I will have our four wonderful women show their wonderful faces. And I will do an introduction. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Happy International Women's Day. Same to you. Perfect. So in my top left corner, I'm not sure <laughs> how it how it uh, is viewed by the audience, but we have Dr. Dr. Galare Zadeh, uh, who was appointed the first female of the Dan Family Chair of Neurosurgery at University of Toronto. She is head of the Department of Neurosurgery at Toronto Western Hospital and co-director for the Kremble Brain Institute at University Health Network. Dr. Zadeh is a senior scientist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center as well. Dr. Zadeh graduated from medical school at University of Manitoba and completed her neurosurgery residency and PhD at the University of Toronto. She completed a fellowship at University College London, UK, while also working as a staff neurosurgeon at the historically recognized Queen Square Neurosurgery Department. In 2008, she returned to U of T as a Canadian Institute of Health Research Clinician, scientist neurosurgeon at Toronto Western Hospital. Dr. Zadeh is a highly respected teacher, educator, and mentor as demonstrated by her receipt of national and international teaching awards. She has trained many fellows and graduate students who have gone on to build independent academic neurosurgical and research careers throughout the world. And Dr. Zadeh has been an advocate for getting more women involved in neurosurgery. So show some love for Dr. Zadeh in the chat, yay. <laughs> And the other three women with us today who are gonna be interviewing Dr. Zade, we're doing things a little bit differently tonight. Um, Shreya, wave Shreya, thank you. Shreya is a fourth year honor specialization neuroscience student at Western University, currently working as a student researcher with neurosurgeons, Dr. Joseph, uh, Joseph Megacy at London Health Sciences and Dr. Um, Michael Cusimano at St. Michael's Hospital as well. To research a novel circumference circumferential resection technique that prolongs overall survival of glioblastoma and people diagnosed with glioblastomas. In 2020, Shreya and her partner placed third overall in Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada's Pam and Rolando Del Maestro student case competition. So show some love there for Shreya and her partner. Um, uh, student case competition proposing a KM enhancer region deletion for regulation of TMZ sensitivity and impaired self proliferation and diffuse midline gliomas. It's a mouthful, Shreya. Uh, inspired by her mom's brain tumor journey, Shreya joined Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada in 2016 to help coordinate the annual brain tumor, uh, the Brampton Brain Tumor Walk, and um, launching a youth campaign for tumor awareness that following year. Her work with Brain Tumor Advocacy and earned her the prestigious Lieutenant Governor's Award in 2018. Currently, Shreya is also a member of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada's Super Kids Program Committee. So kudos to Shreya. Thank you for joining us as well, Shreya. Thank you. Uh, yes, Vis uh, Viseli Balaraja is a research student at the University of Western Ontario, completing her undergraduate degree with an honors specialization in biochemistry. Being a medical student candidate, she is an advocate for health promotion and social support. Vaseli has worked with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for six years now, and she has helped with coordinating and volunteering as well for the Brain, uh, Brampton uh, Brain Tumor Walk and is also part of the Super Kids Committee, which aims to provide educational resources for schools and parents to use when teaching students about brain tumors. During her time with the foundation, Vaseli has helped reinforce the need to support not only individuals with a brain tumor, but also individuals with a patient or a survivor social circle, such, such as family members and friends. Aside from academia and community work, Vaseli is a classical dance teacher and enjoys traveling. So let's show some love for Vaseli in the chat. And last but not least, we have Danielle Froyo, who is also joining us a brain tumor patient and three times brain tumor survivor. For sure, show some love for Danielle in that uh, chat. She is a new mom and a wife and an elementary school teacher. Danielle has been a community event host, walk participant, Super Kids Committee member and ambassador. She is always willing to share her story with our community and was the passion behind a community event that raised $100,000 during a six month effort in support of the hashtag Churn May Gray campaign. Ooh, you're gonna make me cry, Danielle. It involved the sale of beautiful bracelets, a social media campaign that reached people across Canada, the US and even internationally. And Danielle is a patient of Dr. Zadeh. So let's show some love for Danielle as well. And um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing things a little bit differently. 
these three wonderful women are going to interview the other wonderful woman, Dr. Zade. So let's get started. Danielle, I think you got the first question and I'm gonna turn my video off for now. If you need me, I'm just a click away. Sound good? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Janik, for including me in this event. I feel very honored to be here. Um, it's such an honor to not only be a part of this amazing webinar, but to be surrounded um, with such strong, powerful, and influential women. Um, as Janek mentioned, I am a brain tumor survivor. Um, after years of unknown misdiagnosis and almost giving up hope, um, I was properly diagnosed in 2015 with a macro pituitary adenoma um, causing Cushing's disease. Um, I was referred to Dr. Zade and her team at UHN. And since then I have um, undergone two repeat surgeries. Um, they were transphenodal endoscopic surgeries done by Dr. Zade herself. Um, not only am I eternally grateful for her expertise and for saving my life, um, but for the continued care and empathy that she shows me and not just her, her entire team. Um, I have been part of this foundation now for 10 years and one of the programs I also volunteer my time with um, as Shreya and uh, Vasali is the Super Kids program. So um, after one meeting, Janik and I were talking and she mentioned doing a webinar with Dr. Zade and I quickly responded yes without even knowing the details. Um, and as we got to talking um, in the pre preliminary stages, um, I ran the idea to invite these two amazing women to join. Um, not only are they amazing, they're talented, they are beyond smart um, and empathetic women. Um, they not only volunteer their time with super kids, but with the foundation in, in many ways. So um, both of these young ladies are actually striving one day to carry in the footsteps of Dr. Zade, um, and I thought what better way for them to join tonight. So um, I think that can actually lead into our first question. So I'm gonna start the first question for Dr. Zade. Um, the question that um, I have for you is, did you know from a young age that you wanted to practice and study medicine? Or was there a specific point um, or event in your life where you knew that you wanted to pursue what you are doing today? Great, thank you, Danielle. Um, before I start, I just wanted to thank the Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation for organizing this and also for being really uh, the beacon for brain tumor research in Canada. It, the foundation really signifies a, um, a organization and an institution that binds us uh, for what we do that's relevant to Canada. And of course, to thank yourself, Danielle, uh, Shreya for your volunteer work and all of the advocacy that you do, Danielle, it's really quite remarkable. And everybody who's taken time today uh, at 7 p.m. to join, there's I think 50 uh, plus people and I see names from patients to um, friends. And also most importantly, I see uh, my admin who some of you interact with, uh, Lynn Nowen is on, I wish you could see her. Uh, she's a remarkable lady and I have a lot to thank her for. So thank you for doing this. Did I want to do a uh, brain tumor surgery when I was little? No, I actually absolutely didn't want to do medicine. In fact, until um, second year undergrad, whenever somebody said to me, oh, you should do medicine, I, I would uh, not like the idea because I was very good at math. I no longer am. Uh, and I thought I was for sure destined to be a mathematician. And it's really by serendipity that I fell into medicine. I had a professor in uh, undergrad math. I was enrolled in an actuarial mathematic degree in University of Manitoba. Um, her and I didn't jive at the time. I didn't realize that maybe um, her teaching style was not the most effective. I thought it was me. So I quit. I needed that course to complete my degree. And uh, I went and sulked in the library. And a couple of the guys who I went to high school with, they said, well, why don't you write the MCAT and go to medical school? And that's how it happened. I wrote the medical uh, MCAT, I went to medical school. And then um, I thought I really liked to understand the brain function. And in my early exposure to neurology, which is what I chose to go and pursue um, as an early exposure, one of the neurosurgeons, Michael West, said to me to go to the OR with him. And uh, I did that the next day and he was operating on the brain on an arteriovenous malformation under the microscope. 
and the degree of concentration and focus and knowledge that he had combined with the style and his demeanor, his charisma, and just how gentle he was with his patients was so inspiring for me that I think that by itself was the formative moment where I thought this is what I want to do. Um, when you see the brain, it is really the most beautiful organ. And I would say one of the most beautiful things we have the privilege of seeing every day in the operating room and try to preserve it as much as possible. Um, not just from, of course, a cosmetic purpose, but really more from the function to be able to leave an individual as intact as possible. And brain tumors, I really became interested in brain tumors. Um, following my experience with seeing an arterial venous malformation, I thought I was gonna be a vascular surgeon, much like Michael West, because he was my mentor and role model. But in fact, it was Dr. Del Maestro and uh, Dr. Megacy and Dr. Guha who really sparked my interest in trying to better understand the biology of brain tumors and recognizing that the only way we can impact and um, make a change is not only by surgery, but also by understanding the biology of the tumor why we have the tumor in the first place, what additional treatments can we offer patients who are faced with a diagnosis. And it's only really through understanding biology that we can do that. And with that, I then pursued a PhD with Abguha. Um, I've always obviously uh, leaned on individuals such as Dr. Del Maestro and Dr. De, uh, Megacy since they are very instrumental to the success of the Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation as well. Um, and that, that's the long answer to your story, Danielle. I don't know if you expected such a long answer, but that's how I got into brain tumor research and brain tumor surgery. No, that was perfect. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Dr. Zade. So you kind of touched on the next question I had, but I think just to give some context on um, how I got involved with the Brain Tumor Foundation as a segue into the question. Um, I think something you had mentioned once about glioblastomas was that um, when you do a resection, sometimes you can get 90 or 80% out, but there's always a physical component that's left, maybe 10%. Um, and when I heard you say that there's always a component left behind, I feel like you can take that very metaphorically as well. I feel like there's always a component left behind even mentally and just the way that it changes your life. Um, so as Jeanette had mentioned, my mom is a brain tumor survivor and growing up, I think I had to be mature very quickly. Um, I remember a conversation, one of the hardest conversations I ever had, I was being a typical teenager. I was 16 years old. I was being very rebellious and I got into an argument with my mom and, you know, I said, well, you're so dumb. And obviously I don't condone that, but I'd said it and I heard her crying and when I asked her why she was crying, she said, um, and it's like the most heartbreaking word. She said, I'm dumb and that's why I don't work. And she's not allowed to work and she's not allowed to drive because of her brain tumor. So I feel like I, growing up, had to maintain a lot of impulse control and I couldn't be rebellious because I was constantly hurting her in ways that I didn't intend. Um, and then I ended up being diagnosed with an anxiety disorder when I was 16. Um, so I turned to the Brain Tumor Foundation because I felt like I was, I needed help to learn more about how I could help my mom, but also help myself. And when I learned about the work that you're doing, you very quickly became my role model and everything that I wanted to be. Um, so that leads to my question that who is your role model throughout your career and how has that um, individual shaped your current, you know, line of work and the way that you see yourself going? Well, um, I'm going to say that I've had a number of role models, um, but before I answer your question, uh, your story and background was very touching and so generous of you to be so open with it. Um, it, it has made me tearful, so um, it, it's a very touching story. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I think at every stage of your life, you find a new mentor, right? You, when you're a baby, your parents are it, and then you go to school as some teacher or a peer becomes your mentor. Um, like I mentioned, the role model and the person who really inspired me to do neurosurgery was Michael West and subsequently 
other neurosurgeons in Winnipeg. And then when I moved to Toronto, uh, additional members, because the field is still very male dominated, it happens that majority of my mentors and role models, uh, if not most of them, until recently uh, that I took on leadership roles have been males and they've been people who have really helped me get through my career path. And I've really um, recognized early on and valued seeking mentors who I can trust their input and in turn who take the effort to understand where um, I come from and who I am and perhaps what I need. And importantly, I've really come to understand through a mentor who I had, and he passed away this year um, after battling uh, multiple myeloma, in fact, uh, Dick Hill, I really came to understand the value of accepting a relationship of a mentee and a mentor. It's really important to find a mentor and a good mentor, but it's equally really important to be a good mentee. It's not a one-way street. And I think that's when it becomes successful. So you identify a mentor and then in turn, you become an, an important component of the relationship by being a good mentee. And for me, I think a good mentee-mentor relationship is you have to have trust in that both people have the best for the other person in mind. Um, and you're open to suggestions and accept direction from your mentor. And also you're accepting um, suggestions for change. Uh, it may be things that you're not comfortable with necessarily, or you don't view um, the barriers that you're facing with the same perspectives, but your mentors um, provide you with that opportunity. And you have to have the trust in them and the courage and the determination to actually make the changes needed along your path to be able to succeed at the goals you set. So I don't know if you want a specific names of mentors, but I would say throughout every stage of my career, I've, I've seeked at least one or two people who I knew I could trust and take uh, into consideration their counsel and their recommendation. And in turn, you know, I think if you're a good mentee, they too then are encouraged to continue to provide that sort of a relationship. Did that answer your question? No, it did. I 100% I agree. I think it definitely is a two-way street. Um, and I think that in order to learn from someone, you have to constantly adjust and try to see things from different perspectives. So thank you for that. Um, so mine is, my question is the next one. Um, well, when Danielle and Jenik first approached us with uh, being panelists for this webinar, I felt extremely grateful to have the opportunity to interact with someone who's achieved so much in their career. Um, from being Dan Chair and Professor at the Department of Surgery for University of Toronto, to being the co-director at the Crumble Brain Institute, I'm at awe with everything that you do. Um, <laughs> looking back at your journey thus far with being a doctor, um, what is the most rewarding experience that you've had in your career? Um, I, I can't really say it's one thing. I think being able to get to where I am is rewarding. Um, and genuinely, I think cumulatively, if you're able to help people with what we do is obviously an unbeatable feeling in how we feel rewarded. It's devastating when we're not able to help or even more so if through every best intention, uh, our intervention actually fails or leaves somebody with a deficit. But the most rewarding is when you see a success story and just like the mentor-mentee relationship, when you see that the partnership with your patient actually is so uh, successful because it is a journey. It really is from the time you have the diagnosis throughout every single step that you have your treatment, um, additional steps that are needed, et cetera. So I would say the accumulation of um, being able to deliver and uh, care and serve the patients that I see in a positive way is the most rewarding. The other part of what I do, of course, is all the research 
that I spend um, endless hours, of, you know, thinking about it, correcting it, editing it, resubmitting it, whether it's a grant or a manuscript or an idea, a proposal, etc. It's rewarding where when you see that all those hours pay off because you have results that do actually make a change in how we manage patients. And so from a clinician scientist perspective, that I would say is the, the most rewarding in that your research has direct impact for your patients. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna ask the next question. Um, thank you for sharing that from a surgeon's perspective. Um, the next question I have is a patient perspective and it's, it's nice and it's comforting, but it's also sad to see how many um, brain tumor patients and survivors and thrivers are attending tonight. So I hope that this question can maybe help some of you that are maybe wondering the same. Um, as a patient, um, we all see things from a different perspective. And unless you've actually been the patient yourself, um, you will never fully understand what a person goes through. And um, even different brain tumor patients will never understand what each other go through because we all have different stories. Um, I personally have been blessed with an amazing experience ever since being first properly diagnosed and now having gone through three surgeries um, in the care of Dr. Zade. But I know realistically, um, this is not the case for everybody. Um, and positive experience or not, um, there's always room for improvement. So um, Dr. Zade, what do you as a healthcare professional and one being such a strong and powerful female voice, um, what do you believe that needs to be done in order to better bridge the gap between people being diagnosed with a brain tumor? Yeah, thank you, Danielle, for that question. Um, no, it's, it's an important subject and it's a topic that uh, is really dear to my heart in the last few years because from a physician perspective, we work very hard to um, have our foundation of knowledge that can deliver the care, such as surgery, uh, oncological care, radiation oncology, et cetera. But what's important is to actually then focus on where are the gaps in care um, as experienced by the individual patients. And in order to be able to understand better where those gaps are, we need the voice of the patients, the caregivers, to help formulate what the gaps are, inform on where the gaps are, and what resources are needed. You've been to my office, it's myself, and as I mentioned, Lynn, um, who manage the practice that we have. We have nurse practitioners in the hospital, that take care of you when you're in the hospital, physician assistants, uh, all very wonderful people dedicated. But we can only really provide care in acute and interventional stages of your journey. What happens in the in-between stages and the experiences you have and how you then adjust to living with the diagnosis of a brain tumor to your teenage daughter, to being able to work or not, being able to drive or not, becoming dependent as a consequence of it. What that feels from an individual's experience, I think it's really important that we understand, take time to gather as much input until we reach a saturation point and have a full picture of what it is, and then focus on where that resource needs to come from and what type of resources are needed. And that I think is really the next evolution, in my opinion, of how we should direct um, our efforts, in addition to improving technical elements of what I do as a surgeon, uh, oncological treatments that are delivered through chemotherapy, et cetera, and um, uh, research that we do. I think understanding those gaps in care are, are really important and knowing where resources are needed. For example, can we benefit from uh, patient pathway navigators? Can we um, benefit from additional cognitive rehabilitation? Um, can we benefit from early and uh, ongoing supportive physiotherapy? 
all of these areas are areas that I think patients and people who live with the brain tumor, especially in a long-term manner, are best to help inform where we need to focus our efforts. Do you believe that it's also valid to say that um, there could be an improvement in like the long-term mental health challenges and, and support for not only patients like myself, but I know for like family members, I mean, Shreya is a great example. Um, I know my mother and my husband and, you know, um, just because you, um, you have a surgery and, you know, maybe the tumor is removed or your illness is minimized. Um, people often just think, okay, they're, they're great. And there's so many long-term, not just physical side effects, but mental side effects. So, um, I found it very powerful. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry for everyone's loss of the loss of Dr. Gentili, but to bring up the video that was done, um, I know myself as a patient, um, I, I had, I have no words because you don't wish that upon anybody, but it was very powerful to watch him say, now he knows what it's like to be a patient. So do you, as somebody who has worked so fondly and so closely with him, believe that hearing his story and how he saw things that, that a change could possibly be made from seeing it from his perspective? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, living with his experience and prior individuals who would have been colleagues or friends, but also uh, I think most powerful is again, the cumulative experiences that we gather from watching our patients help um, live with the diagnosis of a brain tumor and their family, loved ones, caregivers, learn to manage and to be able to um, really go through the process of grief in a way from the time they're diagnosed to the time they actually come to terms with the diagnosis and then learn to live with the diagnosis. So I think those are, in addition, and in my earlier answer, um, I, I didn't make specific note of well-being and uh, mental um, uh, well-being and balanced um, approach to life with respect to how you manage uh, a brain tumor. I didn't make specific note of that, but that absolutely is part of understanding what patients go through and recognizing the gaps. And Fred, I think, you know, if I was to be um, as open as possible with his experience, I think a lot of it is that initial sense of loss that every person who's diagnosed with a brain tumor and uh, again, their loved ones, families, caregivers, go through the same process of recognizing that there has been a loss and there needs to be a griefing process and then also an acceptance to be able to move beyond it so that you can have a balanced life moving forward recognizing that there, there are changes from the perspectives that you had prior to the diagnosis. So I think those, those are all the elements that go into understanding from a patient-facing perspective and a patient-guided direction. How do we actually um, motivate change and resources? And sometimes in healthcare systems that resources have to be allocated judiciously, uh, it may be that there's opportunities to create resources through um, fundraising that then provides the data. And with that data, we can advocate to get those resources on a more constant um, uh, basis from our government and from our local ministries, et cetera. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. So being medical students or medical student hopefuls ourselves, Shreya and I both look, uh, look to individuals like you and your experiences as motivation and just something they look forward to in order to drive towards our ambitions. So I wanted to know what's one thing that you want future caretakers and physicians to emphasize in their practice uh, following your footsteps in the path of medicine? I mean, of course, um... As healthcare providers, we have to be proficient in the area that we work in. So as a surgeon, I have to be proficient in my role. 
in my position um, as an administrative um, support or an office manager, you have to be proficient in how you actually are the face of that practice as a nurse practitioner, et cetera. The next piece of this, I think, is we need to, as I said before, understand better where the needs of the patients are and people who go through the experience to be able to understand where the gaps are. Because it's not really for me to say, it's for those who live with the experience to recognize. And for those of you who looked um, at Dr. Gentile's video that I made with him, uh, you know, a simple thing, where do I park? Where do I find parking when I come to this massive hospital downtown? And I have somebody who's really having challenges walking, for example. Are there ways to improve that? What seems to be a simple step daily for us, we drive, park, go to work, etc., becomes somewhat of a challenge for the individual. But that's a very small example. I think, how do I manage when I can't drive and I need to be dependent on others to take me places? How am I able to become independent if I'm not able to be uh, gainfully employed, for example? I think the next steps are really to find methods where we can accumulate and gather input from the patients and provide patient facing metrics for what successful outcomes are. So I'll give you an example. In our world, we focus on the rate of infection and trying to decrease it as much as possible because that is important. And that's important for the patient as well, of course, not just from my perspective. However, there are very few metrics of successful outcome that are patient determined or patient facing. So in other words, to say, I would not like to um, sit in a waiting room where there's 50 plus patients. That's a bad experience for me when I'm stressed out and I'm waiting to see a physician. And you know, I'm just making up this random because I picture myself having to sit in a waiting room that's so crowded and feeling the anxiety of waiting for my appointment to happen. So something like that, again, it's simple, but it's impactful to the journey of the individual. And I think we need to find ways to be able to objectively measure those face, patient facing metrics of success, as opposed to what is currently the standard that are physician and healthcare providers metrics of success for outcome. It needs to have now on top of that layered an additional set of data as to what is patient facing success mean for all of our patients, whether it's brain tumors or others. And that we of course need um, partnership with our patients. I think um, one thing that I can say when you were talking about the waiting room, I remember when I was in high school in grade nine, and my mom is watching right now, so she's probably going to remember this, but um, they had done an MRI, just like the routine MRIs that they do. And um, the neurosurgeon said that they think they saw something and um, they didn't know if it was just the angle at which the scan was taken or if it was a residual tumor. And I remember going to the hospital with her and being in the waiting room and just you know, seconds feel like hours when you're waiting to hear back if that residual tumor is just going to lead to a whole other journey that you don't want to go down because, you know, she's been through that again. So um, I, I can totally understand what you're saying. I think it's just a surreal feeling and it's a feeling that you don't know what it feels like until you're in that situation. Um, so I think going into my question, and this is back into the theme of International Women's Day, um, you said in an article in uh, Women of Influence that you'd never operated um, in a room with a more senior female neurosurgeon, and that is because of the discrepancy um, that we see with women in the field. Um, and I think there's a lot of societal expectations that women are faced with um, when they go into STEM, because sometimes we have to balance a family and medicine. So how do you think that experience of never having a senior female neurosurgeon kind of to look up to, how has that shaped the way that you operate today or the way that you mentor others today? And do you think those societal expectations have improved or we still have a long ways to go? 
Um, I'll answer you in reverse, uh, but again, before I answer your question, since now I know that your mom's in the audience, uh, I want to congratulate her for raising a wonderful daughter Thank and you. then also uh, congratulate you for supporting your mom through her journey. Thank you. Um, so the question I would say yesterday, in fact, uh, we were in the OR and we were all women. Um, there were no men in the room and it struck me because it's one of the few times where this has happened as of late. In the past, this would not have happened. So the two fellows with me were women. Uh, the observer was a female. Our anesthesiologist was a female. Our scrub nurse and um, OR nurse uh, was a uh, circulating nurse was also a female. But to have two female um, fellows in neurosurgery with me um, would have not been a common scenario even five years ago. So I think we're changing. I do think in general to ensure a broader uh, reach, more equitable, um, more diversified field, not just in neurosurgery, but in anything. Of course, we can wait and gradually with time things change. However, sometimes change needs to happen faster than the speed of which we've observed um, inclusion in particular of underrepresented minorities of various backgrounds. And so there has to be deliberate strategies to make sure that that change happens. So there has to be a deliberate strategy for candidates that we select to enter our training program. We hire to come into our div division. Uh, etc. So I think change is happening, but in my opinion, it's not to the speed that I had hoped it would, you know, 20 years ago when I entered the field, for example. Maybe it was longer than 20 years ago, I can't remember. Um, I have never operated with a female surgeon who's more senior to me. It actually never struck me as unusual because it was the reality and what I knew that there was always going to be men who would train me in the OR. And it was with time that I recognized it's peculiar that I've actually never interacted with a more senior female surgeon who would have guided me through an operation or who would have discussed a case with me, et cetera. The only other female neurosurgeon in our uh, division of neurosurgery is Dr. Hodai, who also happens to be a female and her office is next door to me but we're of similar uh, vintage. She's my peer, colleague, and friend. Um, and I think, uh, again, because it was an assumed and a given during my training and the generation I come from, it wasn't something that um, struck me as unusual. I accepted it, and I really was focused on becoming a neurosurgeon. So I think the external factors were, you know, my blinders were on and I, I just focused on getting to where I wanted. And then, of course, in time, I've uh, made observations of some of the inequities and some of the clear differences that are in a given room, whether it's a conference room, an operating room, etc. That said, as I started um, the evening, I've had nothing but amazing role models and mentors who are men and equally wonderful trainees who in many ways currently serve to be my role models and mentors. You know, it's that's one of the things I like about my job the best is the ability to interact with people of your age. Um, I stay young, I stay current. I pretend I'm being cool because I'm hanging out with the residents. Um, and typically, again, they have also been men, but it's really great to see that more and more we're accepting females, but I'd really like to go beyond that and have as diverse a group within our division as possible from backgrounds that are not familiar to any of us and to accept every individual for who they are, recognizing they would be able to do neurosurgery, but it may not be the way I've been taught to do it. I think of it and it may be done very differently. Yeah, I agree. I think diversity brings a lot more perspectives to the table um, and it's just another learning opportunity. So mm -hmm. yeah, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> um, 
Um, I'm going to stay on the topic um, since it's International Women's Day. Um, so I know I have asked you this question before and you said you had to think about it. So I'm going to come back to it. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about your family. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you that don't know, she has two daughters and obviously you are a mother. Um, so my question for you is, how has being a mother changed your mentality um, of surgery and work and just the way you treat your patients um, in general? Um, yeah, I, I did say I have to think about it because I think every almost week um, I adjust my perspective. One thing I have learned and possibly you would have a similar experience too with having my daughters, one is 14 and the other one is two, who just opened the door and entered the room. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, so uh, it's that you, you accept them for who they are. So going back to actually the prior um, question, is to learn to be accepting of the differences of individuals. Um, patience is another um, uh, uh, virtue I've learned from raising two daughters, well, ongoing raising the two daughters, because they really have their own individual strengths and their personalities and their likes and their perspectives, um, even from a small age. So one of them just opened the door and came in to say, hello, you may have heard her. Um, but my other daughter is, you know, has always been more reserved and shy and wouldn't have ever opened the door to come into a session. So I think that accepting and patience um, to understand people is probably what um, being a mother has helped me in appreciating individuals, not that I would um, 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 treat anybody as if they're my children, but recognizing that we really are each like a fingerprint, very different from one another. And we need to tailor, even the way I speak to somebody, how I impart information to them uh, about their diagnosis, about their journey is very much tailored to that individual person based on their differences. Um, surgically, how has that changed me? I have to say, surgery is a very controlled um, uh, setup. You know, I, I rehearse every surgery, I perform it to the best of my capabilities. It's very concentrated and focused, which is what I love about it. Um, and so, in fact, perhaps the inflexibility is a necessity because it's a skill set that you have to deliver the same standards. So, you don't want to have flexibility, variability. It's almost like a skill set that you've perfected and it's a brand of what you do that you deliver. So I would say that with my technical skills, um, I, I would remain fairly focused and uh, inflexible in fact, because I would like to deliver a very fixed standard. But being a mom, I do think gives you the appreciation from the moment they're born, that they are, each person is really, as I said, a fingerprint of who they are, where no two of us um, are the same. Um, one of the questions we talked about as a panel, and it wasn't a formal question, but I'm going to ask you it because it kind of ties in with what you said right now. Um, and I don't know if this is a personal question, but do <laughs> you have um, specific rituals that you do before all of your surgeries? Um, no, uh, well, I shouldn't say no. I'm, I'm very visual. I have to picture everything. So I have to picture the surgery from the beginning to the end, from meeting the patient to waiting till they wake up. Um, in particular, what I really like to visualize is the location of the individual tumor to where it sits in the context of their brain in relationship to other anatomical structures, what is it that I have to preserve? Where do I foresee the challenges? And most importantly, I always say, majority of our training is not really on how to operate. It's how to avoid a complication and how to manage it should it happen. And so then what are the biggest risk steps in the OR uh, for that particular person? And so I rehearse that 
a little bit a few days beforehand. So I'm prepared a little bit the evening before. And then on the morning up, we always review it with the team. So we're on the same page. Is that a ritual? Then yeah, that's that's my ritual. But otherwise, no, I don't have any particular rituals. No. I do really like to study the images. For us, understanding the anatomical, like 3D is really important. And because I'm visual, I, I really like to picture where I'm gonna make one cut, where I might make another cut, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring that up because I'm a very visual learner and if I can't see it, I'm gonna mess up somehow. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I wanted to ask you something about your research actually. Um, so recently I read that you developed a sort of blood test to detect and classify brain tumors and correctly identify them. How do you think this would change the patient experience? And how do you think it would change how doctors um, or how it facilitates doctors with correctly diagnosing and developing a treatment plan that's catered for their patient? Yeah, so really a great question. I think in general, when you look at the areas where we've been able to make big change in medicine is when we come up with a predictive testing. So you have a mammogram, it helps determine whether you're at risk of getting breast cancer. It picks up a nodule earlier than the time it becomes an invasive mass. Where we fall short, I think in most brain tumors is our capability of predicting and diagnosing and having a biomarker, a test, a blood test. You know, if I had a blood test that told me I'm about to develop a glioblastoma or a blood test that would tell me I'm about to develop a meningioma or a blood test that says you have a pituitary tumor uh, that's not as invasive and it's smaller and it could be treated faster. That would really transform how we manage people with brain tumors. It's true of every area of medicine, but this is a brain tumor uh, specific session. So for us, uh, being able to come up with a blood test, a biomarker that could then determine if you are A, carrying a brain tumor without maybe even knowing about it, or at risk of developing a brain tumor or have early signs of a brain tumor so that we can then intervene earlier uh, would be revolutionary for what we do. The research that we published uh, approximately two years ago now in Nature Medicine, and we're continuing to work on that body of uh, data is how do we take a blood test or fluid from the cerebrospinal fluid and look at the pieces of DNA that are shed from the tumor into the bloodstream to be able to accurately diagnose the brain tumor type that an individual has. And most importantly, what we really liked, and we demonstrated that, that that is possible. We can take the DNA pieces and very accurately tell what type of brain tumor you have, or one has, not you. And then um, the next step is what we'd really like to do is to say, can we use the same blood test to use it as a monitoring tool to say, the tumor is at bay, it's responding to treatment or it's flaring up and uh, we need to intervene sooner. So an earlier detection method beyond an MR technique, which is what we rely on very heavily now. From MR to MR, every patient goes through a significant degree of anxiety, whether the tumors come back, because inevitably, People have symptoms that they think, well, does this mean the tumors come back? And you wait for that MRI. The MRI only has certain resolutions. So by the time you see a recurrence on the MR, it's already pretty progressed. So is there a way to detect recurrence earlier with a blood test? And A, you can do it more frequently than an MR. B, perhaps it's not as anxiety provoking because it's actually able to detect it earlier than what you see in an MR and see we can then intervene sooner. So this longitudinal follow-up of people with different brain tumor types with um, checking their plasma for the DNA pieces that the tumor sheds is an ongoing project that we really want to be able to have it be successful, launch it and have participation. Of course, because of the pandemic and people not being able to come in person for well follow-up visits, we can't collect blood, et cetera. So we've had a bit of a delay in that. However, I'm hopeful that as we emerge out of the pandemic, that's an area that we can go back to concentrating on. 
because I, I really believe finding the biomarker, making it clinically applicable, uh, also fiscally reasonable, because right now, though we have the test and the biomarker, it costs uh, an excessive amount. Um, so it needs to be a test that's possible within the budget of our healthcare system. And then most importantly, be able to follow patients longitudinally and have them enroll in studies so that we can test the blood and see over time, is it able to predict a recurrence of the tumor faster than what techniques we use now? Do you think that could be applied to first initially diagnosing? Like I understand that this yes, is very good question. So it can be, it's just that requires um, many, many thousands of patients, if not millions, to do large scale to see of one million people, if you take their blood test, how many of them silently have DNA that's shed from the tumor into the bloodstream. So it's definitely possible. It's a matter of the scale of the study with regards to the number of people you need to have enrolled. And because brain tumors in general compared to other cancers are rare, the numbers needed to get there will require a number of years of con uh, concerted effort by multiple sites and institutions. I think it's absolutely important. It's something we need to as a community ad advocate for. Uh, I do think finding that one determining test that can distinguish at least the top five different types of brain tumors we have and be predictive, much like a mammogram is for breast cancer, is, is necessary. Very interesting. <laughs> Wonderful, everyone. What amazing questions the three of you came up with for Dr. Zade. And mm -hmm. I had to step away from my computer a few minutes ago to grab some Kleenex because all of you are very, very, very inspiring. And I would have to say of all the webinars we've done over the years, this is this is spot on. So thank you, Danielle, Shree, and Vaseli for, for joining us. We have a couple of questions that came through the Q&A, Dr. Zade. I'll just read um, them to you. Sure. Um, somebody asked, have you found that your interest and background in mathematics helped with the neurosurgery field that you are in now? Um, maybe not uh, the actual mathematics part of it, but I do think being visual and having 3D um, perceptions uh, and capabilities, I suppose, has helped me with my surgical anatomy. I remember actually, I'll, I'll share an interesting story with you because uh, I worked a lot with Fred Gentili when I was a resident. And um, I, I enjoyed chatting with him and bantering with him. And I remember this case very distinctly. He kept telling me, Hillary, the tumor is over here. I'm like, no, Dr. Gentili, it's over here. And we went back and forth and you know, I was right. And I said to him, see, I was right. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you can picture things better than I can, Hillary. <laughs> I'd also share with you, this, this is really very, very important for me because people often ask you as patients, what would you do when, you know, in a, in a choice that you have to make about a tumor diagnosis, surgery, chemotherapy, gamma knife, et cetera. And we are told in medical school that we really can't give that answer. I did have multiple conversations with Fred about what would we do, each of us, should I have the diagnosis of a glioblastoma? And we both always said, I would probably not do very much. I would get the standard treatment and really work on enjoying my family, my loved ones, etc. Well, you know, 20 years later, he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma and the that is not the direction he chose to go. And he wanted everything done. And I really, I really understood what he was going through because I knew what his answer was even five years, two years, a year before his diagnosis. And it really galvanized for me what our patients go through. That unless you're in their shoes, you cannot say what emotions they have, what reactions they have anxieties, fears, um, ambitions, 
and motivations. And each person, again, is very different. And we have to be able to have that appreciation and allow them to guide us as to what is best for them. And I have to say my experience with Fred really galvanized that for me. So it's, it, this has nothing to do with the question about whether mathematics helped me with neurosurgery, but I, I thought it was important that I share, share this, this kind of experience with you for this session. Beautifully said, Dr. Zade, thank you. Um, somebody else asked, my neurosurgeon passed away and I'm now lost without one. How does one find a new neurosurgeon? Any tips or suggestions there? Well, I don't know if the person is referring to Dr. Gentili. If it's Dr. Gentili, I am happy to take on um, the continuation of their care. I have taken over his practice. Lynn is probably going to tell me off tomorrow, um, but we have a wonderful lady, Renata, who ha helped manage Fred's practice, who's helping us as well. If it is another neurosurgeon and you don't live in the GTA area, um, I think actually probably the Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation is a good place to reach out to. Or if you like to contact me, I can definitely put you in touch with who I think is most relevant to your region, to, to your area. This person is in Toronto area and did refer to Dr. Main Prize at, at Sunnybrook. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to see you if um, you like, or um, one of the neurosurgeons at Sunnybrook, if, if that's the area that you live closer to. There's great neurosurgeons at Sunnybrook as well who manage brain yeah. tumors. Great, thank you. Another question is from Maria, and she asks, what can we do as patients to help with your research on the blood tests you mentioned, especially patients who are based in Toronto? Um, I would say there's three methods. One is, uh, um, as I said, wanting to be enrolled in a study where we follow you up longitudinally and have plasma collected. We're on hold with that because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping that we're able to open that study back up again. We were picking up a lot of um, uh, momentum with it before the pandemic struck. Um, two would be, of course, we welcome any form of donation and support for the research. Um, and three is through advocacy sessions such as this and other means that allow advocacy to recognize the importance of um, philanthropic and um, charitable organizations such as the Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation really make a considerable difference in what we can do and achieve for brain tumor research, especially in Canada, because um, such uh, organizations don't exist um, to, to a high degree. And I would say, as I started the session, it really is a beacon for us to bring together our efforts in brain tumor research in Canada and advocacy and recognition of the importance of it. Absolutely. And for anybody who is new to our webinar series or to Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, our mission is to reach every Canadian affected by a brain tumor through information, education, support, and research. And we also have an advocacy committee that works very hard across the country um, advocating for the, the broader brain tumor community as well. So um, thank you for that. And so last question, and I'll direct it to you first, Dr. Zadeh, if anybody else wants to answer it as we uh, close off the webinar in a couple of minutes. Uh, what does hope mean to you, Dr. Zadeh? Pardon? What does hope mean to you? Um, I, I think it's really not to give up. I, that, that to me, they go hand in hand. And to define your own um, success not go with what's defined by your circumstances, your socio-cultural um, and other people's perspective. Hope is defining what's meaningful to you and uh, pursuing it, not giving up what is meaningful to yourself. Yeah, thank you. Danielle, Vasali or Shreya, anybody else wanna add to that? Um, maybe I can just add on something my mom always says. I think hope is about finding something that you want to continue fighting for. And I say that because my mom always says, I can never win an argument with my mom because she always says, well, I survived a brain tumor. So you can, you can get through this one test or exam. Um, so I think she always says that um, the only reason she 
got through the range mirror was because my brother and I were still like four and seven years old and she wanted to see us get older. And my brother is actually hoping to get married very soon. So um, I think it's amazing for her to be able to reach those milestones with us. Um, so I think hope for her was her kids and her husband. And that was the reason she kept on fighting. Do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, sure. I was just going to add that I think, like you said, hope is something to look forward to and just have a milestone in your life. And I also think that hope is the ability to have self-confidence and just making sure you believe what you believe in and not changing that for anyone. I think. Um, hope for me is similar to what Dr. Zade said. Um, it can be a hard word sometimes because um, you give yourself this idea that you're working towards. And if you don't get there, then you're at a setback. But hope for me can also be tied with um, family or the things around you that you want to be hopeful for. So um, yeah, I guess never giving up and that there's always a new day to come if the current day is not what you were expecting. Beautifully said, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the four of you joining us today. Um, as I said before, this was probably one of the most powerful webinars that we've had. So thank you, Danielle, for the idea and Shrey and Vaseli for your contributions as well. Um, as you can see, I'm sure in the chat, people just loved tonight. So thank you to everybody who joined us as well. Please uh, stay on the line for a couple more minutes because I'm going to do a door prize for everybody who's online and a few um, announcements as well. So thank you everybody once again for joining us and just give me a second while I get reorganized. Thank you, Dr. Zade, Vaseli, Shrey, and Danielle. Um, big hugs and um, yeah, just give me a couple minutes while we, while we just finish up the, the webinar here. So I'll have you turn your videos off for now and um, just give me one second, everyone. going to get reorganized here. So while I get organized, if everybody in the chat can let us know one giveaway that, uh, or one takeaway, I should say, that you uh, got from tonight's webinar, something that really inspired you. And um, yeah, just use the, the chat section there for that. So great, lots of lots of comments here in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that's great. So let's uh, let's do the door prize as the uh, next step for the webinar. I'm gonna share my screen here. Gonna do something fun. We call it we call it the wheel of names. So here we go. The winner of our door prize is. And thank you, Karen, for helping me set this up. Earl Wood, yay, Earl. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for joining us tonight. I will definitely be in touch uh, via email. And I know that you sent in a question, Earl. And if we did not get to it, we will. Uh, I can connect you with Dr. Zade through, uh, through email. Um, so yay, congratulations. And I will definitely be in touch. And so let's just wrap up with um, a couple of more announcements. Get myself organized, reorganized here. Here we go. So many moving parts to Zoom. Thank you for your patience. Here we go.
Okay, wonderful. So yes, congratulations, Earl. You are going to get this fun knapsack and a few other little goodies in the mail very, very soon. So congrats. Um, and wanted to just wrap up by talking about our brain tumor walk. Typically, uh, well, pre-pandemic, we used to host this we used to host um, this event uh, in over 20 cities across the country. Of course, during the pandemic, we switched to a virtual event and it was typically one day, but now we're gonna do it over an entire weekend. So that'll be the weekend of June 17th, 18th and 19th. Um, and this is really just to better accommodate uh, you know, the different time zones and schedules and weather basically. So um, we are encouraging people to find your inner hero and to join us in raising funds for Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and, brain tumor, and, and the brain tumor community. Uh, there are no registration fees to participate. There's no fundraising minimums and you are all welcome to join and make a difference. You can choose to walk in your community or run. I only run if something's chasing me personally. Um, a couple years ago, I uh, had a dance party in the backyard. Last year, I swam. So whatever your physical activity level is or whatever you'd like, wh whatever you enjoy really, we're really encouraging people to, to, be, to be creative with, with your ideas as well. You can participate as an individual or as a team. And you might choose to participate in a day or across multiple days over that weekend or even split the different or the distance across your team and do it as a relay if you want. So lots of lots of ideas at braintumorwalk.ca. Please make sure you check that out. Lots of fundraising ideas and lots of great incentives as well, including if you raise $500 by March 27th, you are going to get this fun, beautiful blue hat. And if you raise $1,000 by April 27th, you're going to get this cool t-shirt. So thanks to our fundraising team for putting these incentives together. And if you are a captain of a team, so if you have a minimum of three people who are going to participate with you, make sure you register as a team because as a team captain, you're going to get a pop-up box and it's going to have cool things like balloons and signage and noisemakers and a whole bunch of other things. So make sure you do that and uh, make sure you sign up as a team before June 22nd if you haven't already. And our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, March 22nd. Today we had Amazing women. Next uh, next uh, webinar, we're going to have two amazing men joining us, and my colleague Todd Gould is going to facilitate that webinar for us. And so Gary Wright is going to share his personal story of hope, his experience being diagnosed with a glioblastoma last year, and Dr. Brian Toyota, who's a neurosurgeon, is also going to be giving some, giving us an update on some neurosurgery uh, techniques and treatments as well. So once again, once you close off of this uh, webinar, a survey is going to pop up on your screen. And we really, really appreciate it. If you could just take two, three minutes out of your time uh, to give us some feedback. So thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. Once again, my name is Jeanette Goryev. I'm the Senior Health Education Engagement Specialist. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me directly. Um, and we will get those questions answered. Or if you need some resources, just reach out. So yeah, I'll just have our presenters show their screens again are there videos again as we close off here perfect thank you again wonderful women and happy international women's day and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight thank you janet thank you thank for you. having us thank you anytime for everybody who joined yes absolutely thanks everyone bye-bye have a good night